Okay, welcome back. Our next speaker, Elaine Douglas, Master of Science, has been a UFO researcher for 19 years. She's currently a MUFON co-state director for Utah, and she was for many years MUFON state director for Washington, D.C. In the 1990s, she was an organizer of Operation Right to Know, an organization dedicated to public protest of UFO secrecy at the White House, the Pentagon, U.S. Senate offices, the U.S. General Accounting Office, and the Washington Post. She is the author of several articles on UFOs and veteran of numerous radio and TV interviews and public talks. For 20 years, she has been self-employed as a marketing consultant, and Elaine holds a master's degree from MIT in military policy. So here to share with us information about invisible UFOs, case reports, and videos suggest the reality. Please welcome our speaker, Elaine Douglas. Hello, everyone. Hasn't this been a great conference so far? For 36 years, MUFON has been putting on a national conference to make sure that we get a continuous supply of information on the most profound development in human history, the arrival of people from other worlds on this planet. If you're not a member of this great organization, what are you waiting for? Golly, get your free gift. Join MUFON today. I would like to hear a round of applause for John Schusler. He's the head of this great organization. and for his team, and for all of us here who have the good sense not to ignore the most profound development in human history. That's our topic, invisible UFOs. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you? I'm here to talk about UFO invisibility. Startling topic, no? How many people here believe that UFOs can make themselves invisible? Hold it, put up your hand. Okay. How many people here do not believe UFOs can make themselves invisible? Oh, good. How many are not sure? Okay, good. Okay. By the end of this talk, we're going to make up our mind. They're making me give a PowerPoint presentation here today, and you know what they say. Power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> so remember that if they ever ask you to give a PowerPoint presentation. Now, I know everyone here wants to see a picture of an invisible UFO. There it is. Just kidding. <laughs> I want to thank two people. I want to thank Ron Regeer, my colleague. He's the one that got all these slides and videos up here. I couldn't have done that. Thank you, Ron. And I want to thank John Schusler for having the vision to see invisibility, because not everybody does. For those of you who don't, and I guess there's nobody, for those of you who, if there was anybody here who didn't believe UFOs could make themselves invisible, you would be in good company. For years, some people said UFOs can make themselves invisible, but leading researchers said no way. They said, if you think a UFO was invisible, what actually happened was it flew away faster than the eye could see. 
And that's rational because UFOs can do that. So invisibility has been debunked. I started studying UFOs, oh, 12 years ago. Fascinating, yes, but it's also unnerving and creepy. As Jaime Masson of Mexico says, they can watch us and we can't see them. If UFO invisibility is real, it means we have to endure the indignity of yet another jaw-dropping UFO capability thrust in our face as the aliens can walk through walls, they communicate telepathically, they can levitate you up in a beam, and now invisibility. As Donald Kehoe, the father of ufology, said, the discovery of visible UFOs was serious enough. If UFO invisibility is real, we've screwed up a lot of cases. We've told a lot of people they were nuts. We've thrown a lot of cases out the window. The all-knowing UFO investigator said, you know. <laughs> I, I distinctly remember one time meeting a gentleman who met some UFO witnesses, and they said they saw a UFO, and uh, these other people, their companions, didn't see it. And I remember how he, he rolled his eyes and said, no, those people are nuts. You know, I know now they weren't nuts. That was directional invisibility, which we're going to talk about. Another time, a woman, an abductee, told me that a huge UFO had positioned itself over her house in, in her Baltimore, in Baltimore, and, and conducted a mass abduction of many people from her neighborhood. And at the time, I thought, how could this be true? Wouldn't uninvolved people have seen this blatant uh, activity and reported it? So if UFOs do have the capability to be invisible, we need to establish that. We need to see our way out of confusion in case investigation, and we need to face the fact, as Jaime says, they can be watching us without our knowing they're there. Today we're going to look at the evidence, videos, witness testimony dating back to World War II. And uh, here's our first category of evidence. Okay, optical invisibility, radar visibility, or you can't see the UFO, but the radar can. A very early case which um, exemplified optical invisibility, radar visibility, is the Nansai Shoto case, brought to light by Donald Kehoe in his 1955 book, The Flying Saucer Conspiracy. This event happened out in the Pacific. An American aircraft carrier task force, the last year of the war, here's how it might have looked. Oh, oh dear, wait a minute. Uh-uh, I made a mistake. I knew I was gonna do this. Bear with me, guys. Um, plus the cursors, okay. Okay, previews. Previous? Previous? No. Oh dear. Oh no, I'm doing it wrong. Sorry. It's my fault. I knew I was going to do this. Previous. Go? What would that do? See, that's why I told you I needed, I told you, here it is. <laughs> I told you I needed Ron. He's a rocket scientist. To do, all right. True enough. Okay, where's the cursor? Okay, now we hit it. 
There it goes. All right. Oh, my God. Okay. Dang. The Pacific American Air, uh, Task Force, here's how it might have looked. The day this happened, all the fighter planes from the whole task force are off bombing and strafing Okinawa. There's only 12 fighters to defend the task force. And, and all of a sudden, the radar operators see a large blip on the radar screen. It's 120 miles away and speeding toward them at 700 miles an hour. To the Americans, this meant they interpreted this as 200 to 300 approaching aircraft, what Kehoe called a mass air raid arriving rapidly from the northeast. When this radar blip, or bogey as they called it, was about 80 miles away, and it was at 12,000 feet altitude, the supposed mass air raid split into two arms as though to surround the task force. Terror, okay, terror. Only 12 aircraft left to defend themselves. Desperately, they launched these 12 aircraft. So now we have the 12 little bitty fighters and the mass air raid arrive. They're moving toward each other. And when they're 45 miles apart, the visibility is 50 miles that day. So already, the planes should have been able to see the mass arriving air raid. Then they move closer together. They're now, they're, now they're only 10 miles apart. Now they're only five miles apart. Look down, shouted the uh, uh, radar operators on the carrier. Look down, you'll see him. Pilots radioed back. We don't see anything. Keo doesn't say how this incident ended, except we know it made a deep impression on the US military. These incidents of radar blips that nobody could see with their eyes kept happening. In 1954, there was another famous event over England. No, she did it wrong. There we go. Good. England, 54? That's what happened. OK. During the month of September, day after day, British military radar detected 40 to 50 targets at 12,000 feet flying in precise and changing formation. First, they flew in a U formation, changing to two parallel lines, then to a Z formation. And they changed fast, bam, 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 with lightning speed. These planes were sent up. What are these? People are on the ground with binoculars. No, we're, what is it? What is it? Nobody saw anything. By this time, Kehoe was calling uh, this phenomena uh, invisible flying saucers. But I say, hey, how, how can you call them flying saucers when nobody saw them? However, we have other cases of saucers in formation where people did see them. We have other cases of visible flying saucers in formation. 1948, Kirtland Air Force Base, visible UFOs in a J formation, changing to an L, changing to a circle. 1954, Hamilton Air Force Base, same type of report. These are videos, uh, visible. Want to see a video? Come on, cursor, cursor. Play. Yeah. Okay. You can't see. That's our category. You can't see the UFO, but the radar can, because what you saw on the video just now was visible UFOs in formation. What you saw in England in 1954 with the binoculars looking up 
was radar targets in formation. I have, a, I have additional cases for the intervening years from 54 to the present, but it, in the interest of time, I'm just going to bring it up to the present because this invisible radar thing is still happening. The first Gulf War, according to Flying Saucer Review, during the first Gulf War, U.S. Navy ships were plagued by frequent mock attacks from radar blips. So they're playing games with us. UFOs play a lot of games. Have you noticed that? Okay, our next category, our next category is the reverse. There we go. Keep this slide up for a minute, guys. The reverse. Before we had, you can't see the UFO, the radar can. Now we have, you can see the UFO and the radar can't. February 1981, the airport in the city of San Jose. 11 o'clock at night, two young guys, both pilots, are trying to land their Cessna 150. Was it uneventful? No, it was not uneventful. An object about 10 feet in diameter with pulsing red lights buzzed their uh, aircraft. They were very frightened. Uh, the two young pilots named Gary Rounds, Charles Shackelford, frantically radioed the uh, control tower. The two controllers, Rich Gooderid, Randy Blount, saw the red lighted object with their eyes, but the radar didn't see it. It was coming right at the Cessna, the controller said. And that small plane had to take evasive action. We could see it, the controller said, but it never showed up on radar at all. Ten days later, the red thing comes back to San Jose Airport. Same thing happens. People see it, radar doesn't. And this is still happening. Here's a reenactment. Contemporary Mexico. The video is a reenactment, but the audio is real. Nothing on radar. Play. There we go. Ready? Okay, here's our categories. You can see the UFO, the radar can't. You can't see the UFO, the radar can. What these cases suggest is UFOs selectively invisible to the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember, radar, visible light, both electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Here's our third category of event. UFOs which disappear without seeming to fly away. This case was reported in the MUFON Journal. The next case I'm gonna tell you about, the MUFON Journal. I, I get a lot of information from the MUFON Journal. If you, don't, if you don't receive the MUFON Journal because you're not a member of MUFON, dang, no, you're missing out. According to the MUFON Journal, November 1994, a lady named Janice Reck, who has a farm in Tennessee, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, finished feeding her cows. And she noticed a, a something on the horizon, you know, coming toward her. Eventually reached her, and uh, she found that it was a triangle about as big as a car, a little a mini triangle. <laughs> Never heard of those before. And it stopped right over her barn. And uh, she, uh, so she starts walking toward it. You know, she wants, she's going toward it. She wants to get a closer look. Bang, it's gone in the blink of an eye. And I could relate to you 
case after case after case of this. Tons of people have seen this happen. Uh, but uh, we have video of it. <laughs> so many people have seen it that uh, there's video. Now, here we go. Now, on this video, which I'm going to show you, which is th contemporary from Mexico, there's three disappearances. Watch closely because they're easy to miss. There we go. They simply disappear, she said. The question now is, where did they go? Did the UFO become invisible, draw a cloak around itself so we couldn't see it? Or did it move away? And the reason we couldn't see it is because it wasn't there anymore. Keep these questions in mind. What I'm going to show you next is a Billy Meyer film made in the 1970s. This is raw footage, 8 millimeter footage. And in this, you're going to see a craft disappear and reappear five times. The audio you'll hear is Meyer talking to a Japanese uh, film crew that's there. And now, because Billy Meyer has a German accent, it's really a very charming accent, it's hard to understand. So I put his, what he says up here, and we're going to read it together, okay? So that when you see it, you'll, you'll get what he says. Billy Meyer. Here the ship is chomping away. There the film isn't cut it. And on that place, when the ship chomps away, it's nearly the speed of light, and you can't see anything. It's here, and it goes, you see? And at that time when the ship leaves, then all was gone, all the wind, all the voices of birds, and everything what's happened around. And you can't hear anything. You can't feel anything, not a piece of wind or something. But it all comes back when the ship returns. And myself, camera, I had something like electric shock. Something, isn't it? And because there are long periods uh, between the disappearances and the reappearances in this video, it seems to suggest that the craft did move away. And the reason we couldn't see it was because it wasn't there. Looking at Billy Meyer's comments again. Yeah. Nope. 
Come on. There's his comments again. He believes the ship left at the speed of light. However, he also notes that when the ship was gone, the wind stopped, the birds stopped, and everything what's happened around stopped. This suggests to me that something remained behind to exert this impact. What we're going to see next is the Japanese, OK, the Japanese film crew's analysis of, the, of what we just saw, what they made out of it. And Meyer has told the Japanese that the ship can travel through multiple dimensions. And on the, this analysis, the Japanese state that when the craft disappears, it's possibly to another dimension. This means that Meyer and the Japanese are not toying with the idea of invisibility. They believe the craft has left the scene. And maybe it has. The Japanese also note that the transition into and out of visibility takes 1 20th of a second and is accompanied by a 1 20th of a second bright flash of light. And this has been noted by other researchers. Okay. So the idea the ship has moved into another dimension is a variation on the more conventional idea that the ship flew, flew away faster than the eye could see. With both these interpretations, the ship is no longer there. You don't see it because it's no longer there. 
Now we're going to look at another video analysis done by uh, Britt and Lee Elders. They note, like the Japanese, the 1 30th of a second it takes the UFO on the video to disappear. And this is contemporary footage from Mexico. Uh, the, the video, this video is not too clear the way it's presented, but I still think it's of some value to us. Interesting videos, don't you think? But we're not making enough progress toward understanding these transitions we're seeing. We still don't know if these craft are flying away into another dimension, flying away fast in this dimension, or becoming invisible. And to shed some light on this, I want to bring out some witness testimony. Ed Walters' uh, 1990 book, The Gulf Breeze Sightings, Ed Walters had numerous close encounters and he took some sensational photos. This is the craft he photographed and this is the craft that he saw appear, disappear, and reappear quickly and at close range without changing location in his backyard. To make this story clear, I've put it up on the screen for us to read. All right. All right, here's, here's Ed Walters. I saw an easy, shadowy movement glide slowly along a dark grass field, closer and closer toward my back fence. The grass field was a dark green. The textured shadow changed it to a fuzzy orange. It was clear to me now the UFO could conceal itself from sight. The glow was there, but there was nothing above it. I had a clear view from ground to sky, and I could see no craft. I could see a complete panorama of the backfield. There was nothing there but the glow. I called to my wife, Frances. And then, wink, there it was. The complete form of a UFO, about 10 feet above the ground, 150 feet away. I heard Francis whisper, call the police. I answered, you call the police? I'm going to get my camera. At that moment, the UFO disappeared. No glow, nothing. Francis and I stood together at the back door and watched for several minutes. Then the UFO popped back into view, the same place it had left. The message was clear to me. Call the police or anybody and wink, it would be gone. Now this whole thing happened in what? Four minutes? Walters sees an easy, shadowy movement. He sees a glow. Then the UFO pops in. Then the UFO pops out, then it pops in again. I, I don't think that UFO went anywhere. I think it was there the whole time. And I think it was invisible. Now, let me give you, I'm going to give you three more cases, weird cases, as though the others weren't. 
that tie in with the Walters event we've just looked at. The first case happened in Australia, the second case happened in Brazil, the third in Vegas. From Filer's Files, this happened September 2104 at 1.30 p.m. somewhere in Australia. The witness is driving through farm country, but then he sees what he calls a, a strange disturbance in a corral. As he was, and he, he's driving by this corral, and he hears a deep bass humming noise. Witness gets out of his car, looks around. You know, it's, he finds no machinery, nothing to account for this deep bass humming noise. But he says, I felt something was present, although nothing could be seen except a large shadow moving around the corral. And the animals were avoiding the middle where this shadow was located. That's a picture, not a drawing. I mean, no, that's a drawing, not a picture. <laughs> Next case, Brazil. Story, Tim Good's book, Alien Base, happened October 1970. Two Brazilian cattle ranchers are working with their animals in a corral. They tied up one cow. She had a calf with her. The calf was not tied up. Suddenly, all the animals become very disturbed, and they're lowing and bellowing, pawing the ground, and the mother cow is constantly turning around to look at her calf. The ranchers are going, what's going on? What's bothering this mother cow? They turn around to look, and they see the calf levitating above the ground. Okay. It's just hanging there three feet off the ground, normal position, feet down, it's just hanging there. And it's bellowing its little heart out. And then the calf begins to move, slowly. Quote, while the rest of the cattle were bellowing, lowing, and churning about in evident fear, the calf moved slowly parallel to the ground, and slowly moves out the open gate of the corral, moves under some trees, and moves out into an open field. Yeah. Now the calf begins to rise, slowly rises upward, and now the calf is silent. It takes three or four minutes for this calf to rise until, quote, still far below the cloud ceiling, the calf became invisible. Maybe I should leave that up there. Good story, huh? Nevada. Las Vegas. If you didn't believe that kid, Brazilian case, you won't, probably won't believe this case either. September 13th, 1994, 4 p.m. near Las Vegas. A hunter is walking through a pasture. He finds two dead cows. One was mutilated, the other dead cow was not mutilated. Then he sees a third cow. The third cow, the third cow was being dragged on its side by an unseen force. The cow, bellowing loudly in distress, dragged on its side across the pasture toward a loud and intense noise. The hunter said the noise sounded like an arc weld coming from a nearby canyon. As the cow is being dragged, it's struggling desperately to get on its feet. It was unable to do so. The hunter 
being a red-blooded American fired a shot in the direction of the noise. Immediately, the cow stopped moving, the noise ceased. The hunter then thinks twice, <laughs> and he goes to get help. He comes back in 30 minutes with other people. They find the mutilated cow where it had been, the dead, unmutilated cow gone, and the cow that was dragged across the pasture by an unseen force gone. OK? So what do we have in these four cases? The only thing wrong with the Ed Walters case is it happened at night. The great thing about the case is it had two witnesses. It was close range. The craft appeared, disappeared, and reappeared in rapid succession without changing location. In the Brazilian case, number three, we see a slow transition into the realm of invisibility. Two stupefied ranchers stood and watched it. And if that story is true, it's, it's pretty good evidence of the invisibility capability, don't you think? In the number four case, Vegas, the cow is dragged by the unseen force, just like in the Brazil case. If that hunter had stayed put and not fired his rifle, I wonder what he would have seen. The cow dragged into a realm of invisibility, like it was in Brazil. As for the Australian case, uh, number two, there's a noise from no apparent source a shadow in the middle of the corral. The cattle, the cattle are all hugging the fence, avoiding the center of the corral where this shadow is, a shadow, just like what Ed Walters saw. You know, the darnest thing about invisibility is you, you can't see it. <laughs> you have to infer it. And it may be that none of these individual cases by themselves is conclusive. But what we're doing is we're accumulating evidence. And I think when we get to the end of looking at all the evidence, we're going to reach a conclusion. OK, next category. Oh, boy. Now, don't try to keep these categories straight, OK? Don't even try anymore. What this category is, infrared or heat, visibility, optical eye visibility, radar invisibility. The infrared can see the UFO. You can see the UFO, but the radar can't see the UFO. D don't try to keep categories straight. Just remember that what we're beginning to realize is that the UFO is selectively invisible in the electromagnetic spectrum and selectively invisible to sensors that sense electromagnetic radiation. The eye is a sensor. Radar is a sensor. And there are heat sensors. Here's our first case with a heat sensor. The case fits into the category that was on the screen. Bruce Maccabee reported this case. It happened in 1990 in Russia. It's just a short snippet, but it, illustrates it. Military aircraft flying near Moscow. Pilot sees a UFO. He trains his radar on it. The radar picks up nothing. He trains his infrared sensor on it. The infrared sensor detects the object. So the radar failed. And, uh, and by the way, he took a picture of it, and the picture came out. So this Russian UFO, invisible to radar, visible to the eye, invisible, visible in the infrared. An infrared camera, by the way, it takes a picture of heat. It doesn't take pictures of the visible light that we see. It captures heat. And I wonder what Ed Walters would have seen in his backyard if he had had 
an infrared detector in his backyard, or radar for that matter. Would he have seen a UFO disappear in front of his eyes, but he's still picking it up on the infrared or on a radar? If it had appeared, disappeared, and reappeared, which it did, and, and during these transitions, if, if the infrared had been on continuously and he got a continuous return, a continuous heat image, despite the visual disappearance, then we would know that the UFO was still there, and we would know that optical invisibility for UFOs is a reality. Now, we have something like that, almost like that in the next video. This is a contemporary video from Mexico. It was brought to light by Jaime Misson. Here's what it is. Simultaneous camcorder and infrared photography and they're on the same tripod. So two cameras mounted on one tripod, so they're stationary with respect to each other. One camera is a camcorder, the other is an infrared camera. Okay, let's watch. Yeah, so many witnesses we threw out the window. We're, we're getting to the point with this uh, subject where we, we're going to be able to move the idea of uh, invisible UFOs from uh, folk tales in, in the UFO community and urban legends to where it could be proof to a skeptical outsider. And uh, 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 
I, I wanted to say that uh, this version of invisibility uh, is sometimes invisible to radar, sometimes invisible to light, but maybe not to infrared. We don't have any cases in which the infrared failed. Did you notice that? Maybe the aliens have not found a way to uh, make themselves invisible in the infrared. Maybe that's their Achilles heel. OK. Now we're going to look at still another variation of UFO invisibility. This is directional invisibility. It means if you're in one place, you can see the UFO if you're in another place nearby, and you should be able to see it, but you can't. Now, this capability of directional invisibility, according to the angle of visual observation, could be established. <clears throat> that would end the question of whether, uh, whether optical invisibility is real or not. If it's true that uh, you can s uh, see the UFO and move 30 feet to the left, and now you, then you can't see it, that would tell us the UFO did not fly away, did not go into another dimension. So what evidence do we have? Here's a video of Billy Meyer describing directional invisibility. Once again, we're going to read what he says because of his accent. Uh, it starts out where the Japanese uh, guys say, Billy, um, when you go out to film these UFOs, this is, there's houses there, cars, roads. Don't other people see these UFOs when you're out there filming them? And Meyer says, OK, Billy Meyer, uh, slide, yeah. You see, that's very funny. If you, if you take this here, and, and he, he points to some object on this. If you take this here, think, now that's the ship. And I'm staying here with my camera. Everything around the ship, up, down, right, behind, will be closed. Nobody can see anything. There is a free line only to see something through, through here, the camera, to my face, to my eyes. And I'm staying here to get the, and I'm staying here to get the picture from the ship. If you stay there, by the lamp or by the tree, you can't see anything. Because there, the sighting will be closed for you. Only will be open this way to the camera. And this happens the most time, the Japanese guy says. How could they do it? And Billy says, I don't know. Come on, come on. Come on. Robert Lassar is another person who talked about UFO invisibility and directional invisibility. Lassar says in 1989 he worked at Area 51 back engineering alien craft for the US government. 
Let's listen to what he has to say. So here we have Lothar saying the UFO can be invisible. And he's also saying that invisibility is a function of the gravity field propulsion these craft use. My own opinion after studying this question for about six months is that UFOs definitely do use gravity field propulsion to fly. But I don't think that the gravity field is the mechanism they use to achieve invisibility. Now, if, I'm not going to continue along that. And if anybody wants to talk to me about that, I'll be happy to talk about it. Right now, we're going to stay on this question of directional invisibility. And uh, Bob Lassar had something specific to say about directional invisibility. Come on, cursor. Uh, but I don't have it on video, so we're going to read it. Here's what he said about directional invisibility. Oh, sorry. You can be looking straight up at it, and if the gravity generators are in the proper configuration, you'd just see the sky above. You won't see the craft there. That's how there can be a group of people, and some people can be right under it and see it, and there can be people, 100 people off to the left and not see it. It just depends on how the field is bent. Now I'm going to tell you about, well, tell you one case from the, uh, that illustrates, uh, exemplifies directional invisibility. McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey, uh, 1980. This case was investigated by George Filer. Uh, who's a MUFON director, he's a former military and the author of the popular Filer's Files. Uh, McGuire Air Force Base, uh, witness called the base and said, guess what guys, you've got two disc-shaped UFOs over your base. This witness operated um, a business near the, the Air Force Base, and he, he saw the UFO through the, the window of his facility. He drew the objects on the window with a grease pencil, according to investigators. The Air Force looked out, outside their, win their windows and said, we don't see anything. So the witness called a neighbor. The neighbor saw the uh, UFOs hovering over the base. Then they called the state police. When the state police arrived, the officers who went on the base and looked up couldn't see anything. The officers who stayed off base on the perimeter and looked as the witnesses were looking saw the UFOs. So I, I see my 15 minutes here. Good. We're coming to the end of this talk. This brings me to my last video and the last part of this talk. This final video is known as the Duryea sequence. And I have to thank Sam Sherman uh, for this video. He's lent it to me, and it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. The Duryea sequence is named after a town in Duryea, Pennsylvania, where it was filmed by a private citizen. Now, what you're going to see 
is a white light poised over a suburban neighborhood. Nothing happens in this video except the flight of a bird and the disappearance and reappearance of a UFO. The UFO does not move. The flight of the bird is important because it is the flight of the bird and when the bird flies right into the UFO, which appears to trigger this brief episode of invisibility. The invisibility lasts only 1 30th or 1 60th of a second. And when the video is run at normal speed, you can't see anything strange. It is that brief. I personally don't know how Sam Sherman, who's the copyright owner of this film, uh, discovered the disappearance of the UFO. Because you can't see it at normal speed. Has somebody got a camera out there? Um, I need for you to bring that camera up here and put it on the, on the table, because I can't have you take a picture. Has somebody got a camera? Help from backstage. If somebody's got a camera, you've got to bring it up here, because this video is copyrighted. I don't own it. It was lent to me. Help from backstage. Someone from backstage, come and help. Somebody's got a camera. What? Well, I saw a flash out there, a camera. It, it, I don't. It's not me, guys. The, the, the gentleman lent me then. He said no copies, no copies of any kind. So I'm wrong? I should forget what I said? Good. Okay. I was saying, I don't know how Sam Sherman discovered the disappearance because you can't see it at normal speed. What Sam has done on this video is show the sequence of the bird intersecting the UFO five times, each time slower than before. The third time you see the bird intersect the UFO, you will see the UFO disappear. The fifth time you see it, the tape pauses to let us stare at the empty video screen. At that moment, there is absolutely nothing to be seen. The UFO is completely, totally gone. And after we watch this, let's see if anyone would argue that the UFO flew away or went into another dimension for 1 30th or 1 60th of a second. For what do you think? Is, is there, how many people would, would argue it after seeing the Duryea sequence that the craft went into another dimension for 1 30th of a second? Okay. How many people would argue after seeing the video that the craft flew away and came back in 1 30th of a second? Yeah. How many people think it was invisible, optically invisible? Well, I think it was too. And w what this means, what this means, what this means is we now can, as a factual matter, can establish that the UFO can make itself invisible. No more urban legends, no more folk tales. Thank God for the, cam, the camcorder, because I think, uh, based on the camcorder, it's a significant advance in, in UFO research. And um, I, I appreciate your helping me to evaluate it or going through the reasoning process with me. And um, uh, you can put that slide back up. I have one more little tiny case. I just want to put the kicker on this whole topic about with this little tiny case involving a bird, hey. <laughs> which I found on the website of the National UFO Reporting Center. This case puts the nail in the coffin. There's the report, the witness, Wisconsin 03. He says, the witness, this happened when I was driving down the street. I saw a bird flying about 50 feet above the ground. It was just flying swiftly through the wind and then bam, 
It stopped dead in flight like it hit a wall. I assure you there was nothing in this way that could disrupt my view. And then it fell and hit the road. Whatever it hit was transparent and strange, but the street lights at this intersection where this occurred have been messed up for days now. You know, the thing that gets me about this story is there's no UFO in it. <laughs> How did it get reported to the National UFO Reporting Center? <laughs> the witness evidently thought, and I'm not saying he's wrong, I think he intuited, you know, I'm willing to do, except that he intuited correctly. But he never saw any UFO, and it, he reports it to the UFO organization. Just like the man in Australia who saw the, the shadow in the corral and the cows hugging the fence and avoiding the shadow in the middle, he didn't see a UFO either. But somehow his report made its way to a UFO organization, apparently some people see UFO invisibility with a third eye. So ladies and gentlemen, that's our talk. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you for working with me to reach this conclusion. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. Oh, do we have any time? She's in control. Two minutes? Does, does that count the five minutes I was late starting? Because I was supposed to get that.